Africa Business News, proudly sponsored by EY. Coming up on Africa Business News, Kenya's high-speed rail system expected to raise the GDP by 1.5%, Zambia announces the new president, and statistics show Ebola infections in decline. Stay tuned. Africa, it is huge, it is diverse, and its business landscape always fascinating and dynamic, and that's our business here on your favorite weekly African business stop. We're joined by Bonnie Tunya in Nairobi, as always, Christy Cole Popola in Lagos, and we will hear from Kristin Mundo here in Johannesburg. My name is Victor Homoeswan, and this is the Africa Business News. Mambo Poa Boni, Kenya's treasury expects the economy to expand by, what, 6.9% this year, up from the initial forecast of 64 More good news for Kenya's future, the high-speed standard gauge rail system is set to raise Kenya's GDP by 1.5%. Tell us more about the project and when we can expect it up and running, Boni. Well, the economic benefits of the high-speed trains will be massive as the immediate effects will include the congestion of the port of Mombasa that will lead to higher volumes of national and even regional trade. And Victor, during the construction of the Mombasa-Nairobi route, an estimated 400 engineers and technicians will be trained on this skilled workforce and will be available for future and local regional uh, railway development. So really it cuts across and at least 30,000 direct jobs for locals will be created during the construction construction with just about 7,963 already working at the project's headquarters. And at the same time, Victor, at least 15,000 locals will acquire skills suitable for self-employment. And now the multi-billion project is not new to controversy, Victor, because facing hurdles from day one of alleged flawed procurement processes and class action suits by residents who are um, relocated to allow for the construction with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi appealing to Kenyans to accept the construction of the line, saying that it will create a link um, that is required in Africa for trade with China. And so Victor, it seems that it's all systems go now as the work has finally commenced. The line covering 485 kilometers is estimated to cost 327 billion Kenyan shillings under the deal uh, with Kenya. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. You are back with us a little later on coming out to us from Nairobi, Kenya. There, We are now with Christine Mundo here in studio in Johannesburg, Southern Africa next. Christine, a disastrous start to the year in Southern Africa. 900 to about 1,000 people in the flood story. What's with Mozambique and Malawi on this one? Well, we've received uh, the death tolls up until this point, about 117 in Malawi, 200 in, 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 in Mozambique. But the story here is that after the floods, um, there is, of course, famine because crops would have been killed, but also the spread of disease. And we've already heard, uh, for instance, the World Health Organization's uh, DG talking at the 136 session that there is already a plague uh, that has outbroken in the case of Madagascar. So there is still a long road ahead in terms of the recovery process. And to mention hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced. In Zambia, the defense minister, now president, Edgar Lungu, winning the, the elections there by a majority, 48.3%. He is part of a patriotic front, if I'm not mistaken. So what can we expect under new, the new government of, of Edgar Lungu? Well, I suppose uh, perhaps a continuity, given the fact that he ran his campaign pretty much the way uh, the former president, the late president Michael Sattar did, promising workers that he would advocate for their rights, uh, especially in the case of the Chinese mining companies. But investors are also frustrated uh, with this government because there's still a lot of uncertainty, particularly on the regulation front. Mm -hmm. So uh, policy con uh, continuity perhaps, but they have to address a lot of issues. Well, I always love how Zambians will have an election without incidents, and it's important because they are far too important as a mining economy in the southern African and central region. But the CNBC Africa team arriving this weekend from Davos, what do you make of our showing there? I am not quite sure what I think. <laughs> well, initially it was all about the ESCOM executive, South Africa's power utilities, right. not, not in attendance. Mm -hmm. But I think that, once again, Davos provided South Africa with the right platform of course, we hosted that debate and we had the honor of having the president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, there. And that gave him the opportunity to address the issue of the power constraints. Now, there was the, the General Electric, this is the global CEO visiting South Africa, yeah. saying Africa is still very important. It used to be an option, but now 
it is a must. Oh. So the world is listening and this provided us a good platform to address our issues. Except we shouldn't be talking about how we don't quite know the extent to which our pay power failure will be because that's the confusing message right here. But thank you very much, Christine. Next up, Christy Cole Popola takes us through some of the highlights of the week from West Africa as we wrap up Africa Business News. Stay tuned. Christy Cole, the elections are definitely a hot topic in Nigeria, although they're only in February at the moment. I hear the United States Secretary of State John Kerry visited your country to chat to presidential candidates ahead of the elections. What is the U.S. interest and how is the political front bracing up less than 20 days to go to the elections? Victor, ahead of the February 14 presidential elections in Nigeria, which is just less than 20 days from now, the political climate has definitely grown hotter. There continue to be attacks on campaign train over either political party. The latest being the showdown over Rivers Stadium in Rivers State and the bombing of the APC rally venue also in Rivers State. And the blame game couldn't get any worse as of now. The, the, the distribution of the permanent voters' cards have been extended until February 8 to ensure many Nigerians are not enfranchised but it is the national security advisors warning that the elections be postponed that has now created the most recent drama leading to the main uh, parties agreeing on one thing for the first time that the elections must hold on February 14 as a result of the pre-election tension now the US government is advising Nigerian politicians to work towards ensuring a violence free February general elections US Secretary of State John Kerry's visit was uh, to drive home that point John Kerry met with both president candidates, the incumbent President Goodluck Jonathan of the People's Democratic Party and Mohamedou Buhari of the leading opposition All Progressives Congress. Now, obviously, the U.S.'s interest in Nigeria, as well as that of the international community, is no longer just the oil, but the very obvious security concerns that come with terrorism and the main aversion, uh, and, and mainly rather the aversion of a much talked about avoidable post-election violence. I'm also aware that billboards of Nigerian political candidates have been erected in some parts of Ghana. Are Nigerians in diaspora able to vote? Absolutely not. Although that has been in the talks for several years now and should have taken effect this year, but so far it has not been implemented. In fact, Nigerians at this point, even with the introduction of the electronic voting system, would still have to be present at the constituencies where they registered on election day before they are able to vote. Now, there are reports of party faithful supporters taking their campaign abroad to Ghana, putting up billboards very much to the irritation of some Ghanaians who fear the pre election tension in Nigeria is now being imported to their country. As a result of that, security experts in Ghana and international relations analysts like uh, Vladimir Danso have been asking Ghana's government to sack officials who approved the erection of the Nigerian political party campaign billboards in Accra. That's Ghana's state capital and, of course, Ghana's largest city. Stay in Ghana, the country that's currently looking to the IMF for a bailout. What makes them so confident that they can double their bilateral trade volume with Dubai of all places? Agreed. Ghana's economic woes last July led its government to admit it would need an IMF loan to pop up the Ghanaian CD, which lost up to 30% of its value against the US dollar in the first half of 2014 alone. And by the fourth quarter of 2014, an infusion of $2.7 billion into the economy through a $1 billion euro bond flotation and another $1.7 billion cocoa syndicated loan facility did help the CD to gain some ground and stability against the dollar and the euro. But then, despite these, Ghana is still known to have no insecurity nor terrorism issues, providing an attractive and safe investment haven for companies. Remember that Ghana still stands among the top five destinations for doing business in sub-Saharan Africa. On the strength of this now, the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry Trade, which recently explored West African markets, it described as promising as part of plans to expand bilateral trade relations, has settled for Ghana. In fact, Dubai says it will trade long term with Ghana, planning to double the volume of that trade over the next five years. Look out for those Middle Eastern investors. They're often underrated as to how much they're doing on the African continent. But after months of brutal struggle with the Ebola virus disease in Sierra Leone and neighboring Liberia, some great news. The statistics of the infection are plummeting. At the forefront of the battle has been the government of both countries as well as the World Health Organization. 
They are now introducing a new strategy to bring Ebola infections to naught. Tell us about this and the implications it holds for West Africa, Christico. Now, ten, uh, 10 months into the outbreak, if this containment progress continues, the world may just be about to breathe easy from Ebola. According to the UN Special Envoy David Nabarro, some $4 billion have so far been spent on trying to curb Ebola spread worldwide, but the WHO still says it's need, it needs $1 billion this year. Now, since erupting in Guinea in 2013, Ebola has led to more than 3,600 deaths in Liberia alone and claimed nearly 8,650 lives around the world. Great news however cases of Ebola in Liberia have fallen from a peak of more than 300 a week as at last August and September down to eight last week also the Liberian government is now planning to reopen the country's 5,000 public and private schools which have been closed since the end of July last year neighboring Guinea has also reopened its schools while Sierra Leone has announced that classes will resume in March that takes us to our trivia of the week and we also get to hear about the favorite stocks of Christy Cole and Bonnie Tunia. Stay with Africa Business News. Okay, Bonnie Tunia, Christy Cole, at this point I ask you if I had 10,000 US dollars in my pocket to invest and I want to buy a share in your region, which share would you recommend and why? Let's start with you, Christy Cole. Uh, definitely Stambik IBTC. It's been rated by many analysts as a diversified play in the Nigerian financial sector. And you're not when you buy uh, the, the shares, you're not only buying a bank, you're also buying a leading asset management and investing franchise. Now, when you consider its earnings growth in 2014, the bank is poised to lead all other lenders on the volumes and value tables this year. How about you, Bonnie Tunia in Nairobi? Well. 10,000 US dollars is always very tempting, but Victor, I'll put it in the banking sector. Equity Bank, to be specific, has had a fantastic run. Looking at the past year, the banking results in the latest quarter has always been resilient across board. Um, we've had it as the third biggest mover, so there's obviously lots of people who are looking at this counter. It's promising future, looking at the acquisition they've gotten into the MVNO space. They're trying to give uh, debit cards to university students. So really, their future is bright. So $10,000, Equity Bank. That tells you a lot about the financial services sector in Africa if the two of our family members here go for banks or financial stocks. Our trivia this week to the Africa Business News family is about a West African country. It is about the overthrowing of a democratically elected head of state. On January 27th in 1996, a certain president was toppled in a military coup by a Colonel Ibrahim Minosara. Which country am I talking about here? That should be Mali. Spot on. After winning the first democratic election in 1993, Mahmani Osman was elected president. This led to a truce between the government forces and the Tuareg's revolutionary armed forces of the Sahara in 1995. In 1996, however, Osman was overthrown by Colonel Ibrahim Manasara, who subsequently banned political parties. Of course, he won the presidential election in July 1996 after a referendum paved the way for the banning to be lifted. Manasara ended up being assassinated by his own bodyguards in 1999. We're back with you next week with more Africa Business News. We thank Bonnie Tunia in Nairobi, Christy Cole Popola out of Lagos, Nigeria, and earlier on Christine Mundo here in Johannesburg. Stay tuned to CNBC Africa until next week. Waherini mabibi na mabuana.